the first player ever drafted out of Lindenwood University sure. in Missouri. Please welcome to the show, Colts corner, Pierre Desir. All right. Hey. What's up, Lindenwood? Hey, hey. Yeah. What's up, man? What's up, man? <laughs> How we doing? Pierre, as I just mentioned, you're the Colts nominee for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. The city of Indianapolis loves what you do there. What does that honor mean to you? And really, what are you playing for out there? Uh, it's a tremendous honor. Um, you know, when I'm out there on the field, uh, you know, I'm playing for my family, uh, playing for my fans, playing for everyone that's just supported me uh, throughout my throughout my life. Uh, and it's just a tremendous honor. It's, it's something that uh, I don't take lightly. Um, I'm just very appreciative and just thankful every day. And your family's from Haiti, Pierre, and it's quite a remarkable journey. Your parents immigrating, moving to Missouri when you were just four years old. How did your upbringing help inspire you to want to give back to the community? You know, my, my parents are very hard workers. Uh, they always instilled uh, just giving back, and uh, that's something that I try to continue uh, every day, uh, just give back whatever I can do, whatever, uh, you know, opportunity that I can give give back to the uh, community, um, you know, just something that they just completely just instilled in myself and my family. And that's something that I try to do. Um, I try to show my kids uh, that it's that you can always give back, whether it's the simplest things or just, you know, giving the helping hand. And that's what I try to do. And uh, that's how I try to live my life. Pierre, man, what's up, man? I appreciate you joining us. Now, you were also forced to grow up a, a little bit faster than most. You and your wife welcomed right. your first child into this world when you were just 16 years old. How much did that force you into maturing into the man that you are today? Yeah, um, you know, being 16 and being a dad, I had to mature very quickly. Um, I, it, wasn't about, it wasn't about me. It was about this beautiful uh, baby girl uh, that uh, I had to look after. And I just had to make sure that you know, I was going to set a good example for her, um, that we was going to give her everything that she needed and just, you know, try to, you know, raise a, raise a, you know, a good person. And uh, it was definitely, it was definitely tough, challenging, but, you know, I had so many people in my life, my family, my friends, teachers, uh, just so many people that supported me, uh, that helped me uh, during that time. I can tell. It shows. And it's always exciting to talk to a Lindenwood Lion, Pierre. But you have been around a bunch of different teams <laughs> early in your career. You were in Cleveland, San Diego, mm -hmm. Seattle, and you got a three-year contract extension in Indy before the season. Do you feel like you're home now, playing there for Frank Reich in Indianapolis? Are you established? Is this your future? Yeah, I feel like I'm home. I love uh, Indiana. I love the fans. I uh, love this team. Uh, it's definitely changed my life. I knew when I got my opportunity to uh, to play here, I was going to make sure it counted. And uh, that's what I try to do every day, just make sure it counts, uh, do whatever I can for the team. And it's just, it's, it's always a good feeling as a player when you know you have a home. And, uh, you know, I just love it here. And I'm, you know, thankful for the opportunity to be here. Pierre, I don't know if everyone understands exactly your story and just how different your college experience was. You were at Washburn University in Topeka. Then you transfer to another school, Lindenwood. This isn't Ohio State to Alabama. You need to take a year off. And to make ends meet with a young daughter, what were some of the jobs you had to do just to keep yourself above water and above ground? I think the audience should know. Uh, yeah, so I used to, uh, there's this place, uh, it was called Labor Ready. It was a temp service job. And every morning you wake up at 6 o'clock, um, 6 a.m., and they basically would pick certain guys to do certain jobs. Hopefully you got picked that day. Um, if you didn't, you wouldn't have a job. But uh, some of the jobs were, you know, either cleaning uh, litter on the, the you know, side of the highway, um, restaurant jobs. I did some sanitary work. Uh, probably the worst job that I ever did was, uh, it was during flood season. I worked in this apartment complex and uh, it was, the water was probably about chest high. And I'm pretty tall, so there's some people a little bit shorter than me that are, you know, all the way up here. Uh, with water and uh it was it was you know the 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 basement was flooded with you know uh any everything it was it was disgusting you know i got 725 mm. seven dollars and 25 cents for it um i think my check at the end of the day was about 200 dollars, but i got to eat that day um got to support my family uh that's definitely something that i look back on when the times are hard when you know when the season's you know going tough just look back on that and be like hey you remember the time that you was out there you know 
uh, in the in the basement, you know, in knee knee high water. So uh, you know, definitely interesting jobs, but uh, it's you know something that you know I don't I don't take for granted. I look back on it and, and it's helped me uh, you know just keep pushing. That's awesome, man. It really wow. puts things in perspective, what rough times really are. Appreciate what you do on the field and what you're doing off of it. Um, and anytime you want to come on the show, mm -hmm. man, come on. We'd love to have you, man. Keep hey, doing your thing. absolutely, man. Stay I got you, man. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy your offseason. I remember you were back in Cleveland, man. You were a young monster. And you yes, sir. Yes, an sir. Absolute beast. <laughs> and a quick shout out to you and Appreciate Francis you. Howell. He was a Francis Howell Viking in St. Charles, Missouri, where he turned around after all of those jobs finding his way to the NFL and creating a brand new performance center. You donated $185,000 to that. Christmas, everyone. We are here live on our set at our breakfast table for Good Morning Football. Will Selva, part of our family, wishing you and yours a very merry, help, happy, and healthy Christmas. And same to all of you. Once again, we will be off tomorrow. So can't wait for that. It is an exciting day for the kiddos. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the uh, Steelers' playoff hopes will rest on the healthy shoulder of Devlin Duck Hodges. We say healthy because the shoulder of fellow backup Mason Rudolph is anything but. NFL Network Insider Ian Rappaport reporting Rudolph will be out in multiple weeks. According to Ian, even if the Steelers make the playoffs, Rudolph's injured shoulder is expected to make him unavailable. Rudolph came into the second quarter of the loss to the Jets only to exit. Paxton Lynch will be the backup. Another quarterback who is seeing his season end early is rookie Dwayne Haskins. Rap Sheet also reporting Haskins suffered a high ankle sprain. He went further tests on Monday. Interim head coach Bill Callahan ruling Haskins out for the season finale against the Cowboys. Case Keenum will be under center instead. The season of fellow rookie Kyler Murray may not finish prematurely. Also, according to Ian, an MRI revealing nothing alarming about Murray's hamstring. Murray has a minor hamstring pulse suffered in the win over the Seahawks. The Cardinals will see how he progresses this week before making a final determination on his availability in the season finale against the Rams. And now to the latest on Leighton Van Der Esch's neck. NFL Network's Jane Slater reporting doctors determine a minimally invasive surgery will fix the nerve issue in his neck. He should be back well before training camp, as reported by Jane. LVE has been sidelined for the last five games. Van Der Esch has battled neck issues since his days at Boise State. We've always looked at wonderment at his neck roll. Probably explains one of the reasons why he has it, but otherwise, good news there on Leighton Van Der Esch and his neck, and he should be good to go by the start of training camp. Mm, not enough Mason Rudolph Rudolph puns from you in that first story. I gotta say, I'm gonna give you like a Mugging. five out of ten on that entire uh, report. Get your stuff together, Will. Oh, all right, all right. I'll do better. I'll do better. Do my job. Uh -huh. I'll do better. Get Get back in the lab. In the meantime, let's talk about those Cowboys. Their performance week 16 had fans in Dallas scratching their heads, and they're going to need some help this weekend if they want to save their season. With more on everything Cowboys, James Slater tells us what's up. Thanks, Kay. I know you covered this game pretty extensively on Monday, but on Monday afternoon, we got, of course, some more details about why they decided on fourth and eight not to put their two wide receivers on the field. No Randall Cobb, no Amari Cooper. Now, Cobb had three catches for 52 yards in that drive, but he was curiously off the field. And then Amari Cooper, well, I was told that he had gone on a go route, then a seven route, and they thought he was too gassed to do yet another go route. So they thought they would take advantage of the Eagles defensive backs who were struggling against smaller, shiftier receivers. Enter Tavon Austin. Dak Prescott ultimately got the ball to Michael Gallup. It didn't end up working out, and that's how the game ended. It was Jason Garrett who on 105.3 The Fan was asked who made the play call, and he said, well, that was Kellen Moore, and the decision to rotate those receivers, Sanjay Law. Bringing in once again the question, is this head coach Jason Garrett holding himself accountable enough for some of the woes this season? Okay. Appreciate you, Jane. Let's go to Nate on this one. We heard Garrett's explanation for, of course, not having Cooper and Cobb on the field at the end of the game. You heard what Jane said that he said. What's your reaction to the coach sort of tossing blame at his staff and his OC? Man, they passed the blame better than they passed the ball. Talk about um, Nah, let me not take too many unnecessary shots. They're dealing with a lot in Dallas. Here's the thing. I made a statement yesterday, a little bit of a rant about players staying on the field. Now, if that was indeed Kellen Moore's decision, I'm going to have to say, Jason Garrett, why was it Kellen Moore's decision? 
if you're the head coach, wouldn't you have final say of who's on the field in the final moments of a game that matters more than any other? It could be true. 